and then um, if anyone joins later, then they can just figure out what we're talking about as we go. So I just made Autumn co-hosts, and I think if we just want to take a couple minutes to explain what you were just talking about, Autumn, with your office hours, and then we'll start talking about memory. Okay, so um, there is this website called Calendly, and they allow you to do like virtual meetings, kind of like Zoom. Um, so you would just set up an appointment on Calendly and we can either do like a Zoom meeting or like a phone call meeting or whatever works for you. So I'm just gonna send out a chat with the link for it. And I have a lot of availability um, set, up, set up on there. Let me see what this message is saying. I'm just gonna send the link. They're trying to send a really big message. So if you want any help with um, anything going on in the class or have any questions, um, you can feel free to use the Calendly link. Like it would be um, visiting the size space basically. That's awesome. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, of course. And if there's any times outside of mine that work like won't, don't work for you, just let me know. And I'm pretty open availability at the moment. So yeah, I'm just going to save this link really quick and then we'll get to our lecture. All right, so I'm going to go back to screen sharing. And if one of you or if Autumn, if you could just let me know when it pops up for you, because you guys said there's a bit of a lag. Yeah, it's there. Okay, perfect. All right, so today we're going to cover memory. Um, in the Qualtrics survey I sent out, this was apparently everyone's like least interested topic or the topic they were least interested in. Um, so we're gonna try to cut it down a bit. I'm not sure if we'll be able to finish all of it today, but a good chunk of it I think we can get through. Um, so we'll just kind of power through memory. I don't have too many activities for memory. Some of them that I was going to do um, require YouTube videos. So we're just going to power through, stop me if you guys have any questions, and then we'll finish it up on Thursday and get to personality, which I think a lot of you are more interested in, and personality is one of my favorites, so that'll be fun. Okay. So what is memory? When we talk about memory, we're referring to the structures and the processes involved in both storage and retrieval of information. So we have to save that information, we have to store it, and then to remember something, we actually have to retrieve it. We have to bring it back up later. So when we're talking about memory, we're talking about all these different processes and structures that are involved in that storage and retrieval. When we use language to describe memory, sometimes we talk about it as if the mind is a physical place and you're looking for something. So this way to describe memory is known as the search metaphor. So that's just talking about memory using terms that relate it to physical space. So when you're remembering, you're searching for something in your mind. If you can't find it, you can't remember that thing. So this is thinking about your mind as a physical space and memories as the things that make it up. And as I get to the next slide, you'll see that this is not the most accurate way to conceptualize memory, but it is a way that we use a lot just in order to use language to describe what we're remembering. So a more accurate way to talk about memory, we call the reconstruction metaphor. So this is better than the search metaphor on the last slide. And this says that memories are reconstructions based on available information. So when you're remembering something, you're reconstructing that event, you're reconstructing what happened. So it's based on the information that you stored in your memory and the current information around you that's providing the cues that's triggering that memory to happen. So your perceptions in the present actually play a key role in your memory of the past. So this is a more accurate metaphor.
one way to think about this is to think of a paleontologist. So those are the scientists that study dinosaur fossils. So when you think about reconstruction, you can imagine it as reconstructing a dinosaur skeleton or dinosaur fossil. So those paleontologists find some bones, but many of them are missing. And then they're filling in the gaps with what they already know, with what they found, and making an educated guess about what the entire picture looks like. So the complete dinosaur skeleton would be a complete memory in this metaphor. So many parts are correct. We have that information stored. We retrieve that information. But some of it are guesses that we've filled in. And some of it is just wrong. We don't have that. We filled it in incorrectly. So this is a nice way to think about that metaphor, to think about memory as reconstructing something. For example, a fossil, a skeleton. And I took this picture from Jurassic Park. This is the same definition that you had on your first slide. Memory is the structures and processes involved in the storage and the retrieval of information. And memory is what facilitates learning. So this is how it's kind of tied in with chapter seven. So we use memory and that retrieval of information in our process of learning. And so whenever you guys take a test, um, not only are you encoding and storing information in your memory, but then when you actually go to take the test, you have to retrieve that information to show that you learned it. So memory can be accessed in three ways, and we're gonna go into each of these three ways in detail. Recall, recognition, and relearning. So recall is when you're retrieving information that you learned earlier. So if I gave you a fill in the blank question on a test, which I'm not going to do, as you know, um, you would have to recall that information from your memory. You'd have to take it out of its storage and recall it and produce it. So that's recall. Recognition might be a little bit easier. You don't have to produce that information all on your own. Recognition, you just have to identify something previously learned. So an example would be our kinds of tests are multiple choice tests. So I give you all of the items and then you have to identify which one is correct, which one is the one that you learned. So recognition, you're identifying items previously learned, but you have those cues in front of you. And then relearning is being exposed to information over again. So if you were going through your notes over again, rereading the book, going through these slides again. That would be relearning. And you do this when you review for a test. And I don't have the chat up. Does anyone have any questions so far? If not, I'll just keep going. Um, but I wanna make sure you guys stop me if you do. Okay. Everyone's very quiet today in Zoom land. So we covered this a little bit already, but how does memory work? First, we have the process of encoding. This is how our brains commit an event to memory. So your book refers to it as solving the encoding problem. And then we have to store that information. So this is storage, it's just the process of maintaining that information over some length of time, whether it's a short amount of time or a long amount of time in the case of long-term memory. And your book refers to that as solving the storage problem. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about all different kinds of memory today. And we're going to move from more immediate memory that only lasts a few seconds to long-term memory that you store over a long period of time. Okay. When we encode information, as you guys remember from the sensation and perception chapter, we take all the stimuli in our environment and we have to translate that into something that our brains can actually understand. So it has to be transduced into neural impulses 
So if you remember from that SMP chapter, every different kind of stimuli, whether it was light or sound, it had to be changed into a type of information your brain could understand. Um, once it's translated into those neural impulses, then it can be stored by your brain, encoded by your brain. And if it's something that's stored for a long term, added to your long term memory. So first we're going to talk about sensory memory. And sensory memory is very brief. So this is the system that keeps information translated by your senses. It keeps it very briefly active in a relatively unaltered, unexamined, unchanged form. So sensory memory, literally just think of your senses. So the information you're taking in from light, we talked about how it went through your eye, and that first brief second of information about what you're seeing, that's going to be your sensory memory. So this helps us experience the world smoothly. It holds information long enough to stitch moments together so that our lives aren't really abrupt um, changing of one sense to another every second. Everything seems smooth because we have the sensory memory to hold that little bit of information for a very brief amount of time. Our sensory memory feeds into immediate memory, which is the next shortest type of memory. And I think that is that on the next slide. In a couple slides, we'll talk more about immediate memory. So sensory memory is that sense information. It's very brief. And it's just our nervous system holding on to that sensory info for a very brief amount of time. So there's two different types of sensory memory we talk about. One is visual and the other is auditory. Um, so iconic memory is the visual type and echoic memory is the auditory type. An example of iconic memory is when you move a light in the dark. So in this picture, someone's moving a sparkler and you have a really brief after image where you still see that trail of light. So this is an example of your brain holding on to that visual information for a really short period of time. So if you've ever done that, where you waved a sparkler at night, you see that light trail for a really brief amount of time and then it disappears. So that's pretty much the length of the sensory memory. It's that short. So our iconic memory has these fleeting after images, for example, um, a sparkler in the dark lasts for less than a second, and we call that neural activity an icon. Echoic memory, on the other hand, um, does the same thing but for sounds. So if you think about if you've ever been sitting in class and you weren't really paying attention, um, but then the teacher called on you, you can kind of recall the last few words they said. Uh, that's because you have this echoic memory. So you're still hearing the last couple of seconds of sound in your mind, even if you weren't really paying attention, that's there for just a few seconds for you to process. And echoic memory lasts a little bit longer than iconic memory. It lasts about three to four seconds. And this neural activity is called the echo. So iconic, you can think of an icon as something visual, echoic and echo obviously is auditory. So an example of a echoic memory would be if I told you my phone number for a few seconds, even if you didn't have it written down, you could probably spit that number back out to me. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about sensory memory or about memory in general? So we are going to do a really brief little experiment, and this will be an example of iconic memory. So for those of you guys that are paying attention, pay attention right now. I'm going to really, really quickly pull up a slide, and then it's going to disappear, and I'm going to ask you guys a question about it. So ready? OK. okay. So in the chat, let me know if you guys remember any of the letters that were on that slide. Okay. 
xbk, jxqr. Yep, those are all on it. Mm -hmm. Yep, these are all so far correct. I have to double check here. Yep. Yeah, so you guys remembered letters, even though you only saw it for a really brief, less than a full second. It was probably a part of a second. <clears throat> so this is actually part of a famous experiment. Um, George Sperling is a psychologist that started doing sensory memory research in the 50s, and he wanted to find out how long these sensory flashes linger. So when I flash that slide, and these are the, the letters that you just saw, so you guys were all correct. When I flashed that slide and then took it away, for a very brief part of a second, you guys had that iconic memory of the slide. You had that after image in your mind. And he wanted to find out exactly how long do these flashes linger. So he gave participants different blocks of letters like this in three by three rows, and he only showed it to them for 1 20th of a second. So he probably had a better way to measure it than me just clicking through my PowerPoint. So he showed it to them for exactly 1 20th of a second, and then he asked participants to recall the letters. So in the first experiment he did, he just asked people to remember as many letters as they could, and participants could only correctly remember about half of the letters. So the icon, remember the after image is called the icon, that faded too quickly to remember all of the letters. People remembered about half, and it seems like you guys remembered like two or three rows. So you remembered about a third or half. So in his next experiment, he decided to have participants remember specific rows instead of the entire image. However, what's interesting about this is he didn't tell participants which row they had to remember until after he took the image away. So the way he did this was he paired different tones with each row of the block. So if you imagine this top row, XBK, if I played a high tone, that would be me indicating to you, remember the top row. And then he had a middle tone and a low tone for the bottom row. So what he did in the second experiment is the same exact thing. He showed the letters for a 20th of a second. Then after he took them away, he played the tone. That told people which row to remember. But again, remember, they're not hearing the tone until after they already see the image. But because this instructed them which row to look at in the after image, they were actually better able to remember the letters. So even after you took it away, you have your after image for a part of a second. That tone told them where to look in the after image, and they were able to recall almost all of the letters. So this icon, this after image, is something that exists in your sensory memory, and you can manipulate that information for a part of a second or maybe a second. Okay. So we used this word a couple times already, but I want to make sure you guys understand um, what encoding is. So encoding is when our sensory memory, so we talked about those senses, um, you're taking that sense info in, and it's bridging the gap from that perception of sense to actual memory. So when we're encoding something, it's going from just your senses to memory. The next level of memory up from sensory memory would be your immediate memory. And this is also called short-term memory, and it's also called working memory. So you'll hear people use all of these terms they're all the same thing. Um, when I was an undergrad, I think I mostly heard working memory, but I think your book mostly uses immediate memory. These are all just the same thing. So immediate memory is the system that actively holds on to a limited amount of information so that you can manipulate that information and process that information. So like holding something at the front of your mind, that would be your immediate memory. So if you're doing a math problem, you're trying to hold that information of what numbers you're adding together there. You're trying to work with that info and manipulate it. That would be using your immediate memory. Close the check.
So immediate memory holds on to that limited information. We can manipulate and process that information. Some people like to use the metaphor of computer RAM and computer RAM is where the currently active programs on your computer are operating. So if we think about our brains like a computer, the RAM would be our immediate memory. It's what we're currently manipulating. It's in the forefront of our mind. So immediate memory, working memory, short-term memory, all of that means this information that's presently being manipulated and processed. So when we talk about immediate memory, we wanna know what kind of information is being represented, how long can memories be held, and how much information can we hold. So with sensory memory, it was only a part of a second or with auditory information, a couple seconds. With immediate memory, we can hold information a little bit longer. And so we're gonna look at what kinds of info, how long, and the capacity of that type of memory. So the type of information represented by our immediate memory is mostly visual and auditory. So it's taking that sensory memory information and then manipulating it and processing it. You have something called your inner voice and your inner eye. Your inner voice would kind of be like that inner monologue in your head. And your inner eye would be your visualization of something inside your head. So if I told you guys right now, to just not out loud, but to yourself, count to 10. A lot of you guys in your head would probably be saying one, two, three, et cetera. That's an example of your inner voice. Your inner eye, if I told you to picture your dorm room, even though probably none of you are in your dorm room right now, you would still be able to visualize it in your mind. So that's what's known as your inner eye. So that was the type of information in our immediate memory. The duration depends on how long we rehearse that information. So how long can it stay in immediate memory depends on our rehearsal. And rehearsal is just repeating information to yourself to help you rehear it over and over again. So we're using that inner voice or that um, sensory memory. We're repeating the information. We're rehearsing it and rehearsing it over and over again makes it last longer. So maybe I told you my phone number, um, and if you didn't repeat it to yourself, you might immediately forget the phone number. But if you keep repeating those numbers in your mind, that would be an example of rehearsal. So it's going to help you remember that information for longer, and how long just depends on when you stop rehearsing it. And finally, our capacity is how much information can be held by immediate memory. This is referred to as memory span. So basically, how many items can we keep active in the forefront of our mind at one time? And what people commonly agree on is that we can hold seven plus or minus two items. Plus or minus two just means either anywhere from seven minus two items or to seven plus two items. So anywhere from five to nine. So on the test, if I asked you about working memory or immediate memory capacity, what would that capacity be? People generally agree on seven plus or minus two items. So there are some exceptions, but for our purposes, we're gonna go with this generally true number. And this is one reason why phone numbers in the United States are seven digits, because that's how much information we tend to be able to hold in our immediate memory at one time seven items. So researchers have found the capacity is more accurate, accurately whatever you can rehearse in about two seconds, and that just happens to be about seven items. So if you want to think about it in seconds, it takes you about two seconds to rehearse seven items. Um, what's interesting is this is not universal. So different languages um, are going to have different words for items. So in Chinese, students have been found to be able to keep one more item in their mind than American students. And that's just because the Chinese words for numbers take less time to say. So you can think about 
the language of the actual item, the words for the actual items you're trying to remember, that might affect how long it takes to rehearse and that will affect how much information you can hold. So here in the US, we say about seven items. Do you guys have any questions? All right. I trust you guys to ask if you do. Okay. But throughout this lecture, I've included some memory tips. And this is just a nice way to provide um, examples of how you could use memory, use what you're learning about memory in this class in your own life and in your own studying. So memory tip number one is called chunking. So this is grouping individual pieces of information together into larger chunks, and this helps us remember them together, remember them better. So if I just said the numbers three, four, five, two, eight, seven, nine, it's going to be harder to remember, but if I chunk them as three, four, five, two, eight, seven, nine, so in a format of a phone number, it's going to be easier to remember that information in chunks. And this is actually one way that um, people that compete in memory championships, which is a real thing, uh, this is one way they use to remember vast amounts of information. So they chunk them together. It's also helpful to group items in some way that makes them meaningful. So you can see this random collection of um, letters, H, T, D, I, G, A, N, S, I, E, T, U, Y, that's not meaningful to me in any way. But if you group them in a meaningful way, I hate studying, that's the same letters, but grouped differently. And because it's meaningful, it allows us to remember it more easily. So using that meaningful structure increases our immediate memory capacity. So if you think now you're just remembering three items, three words, instead of all of these separate items that don't have any, any meaning necessarily. So as we determined, if you were here for lecture the other day, it's not that fun to have you guys watch videos on my screen because it lags. So I'm gonna post the videos again on D2L, but this is one of the US memory championships. And it's kind of interesting. It has these people that competitively remember random information. Okay. <clears throat> so your book talks about the working memory model. This is a model for immediate memory. And I just wanna keep reminding you guys that working memory and immediate memory are the same thing. So the model of immediate memory is the working memory model. They're just two terms for the same thing. Immediate memory is not simply for storing information. This model says, as we already mentioned, it's also a place to manipulate that information in your consciousness. So again, if you're doing a math problem, three times two equals six, you're gonna use your working memory to manipulate that information in your consciousness to come up with the answer. For whatever reason, when I think of manipulating information, I think of math, but if there's something else that helps you remember better what this means, then you might wanna remember that. Our working memory can be thought of as being managed in two different places. And we already talked about the inner voice and the inner eye. The actual names for these are the phonological loop and the visuospatial sketch pad. So those are just kind of fancy terms for what we already deemed are your inner voice and your inner eye. So the phonological loop, that inner voice, this is where your auditory and verbal information is stored and manipulated. So again, if you were in your head counting something um, and you have that inner voice counting out loud, that is where that information is stored and manipulated. Your inner eye, also called the visual spatial sketch pad, is where this visual and spatial information is stored and manipulated. So if I asked you um, how many windows are in your house, you would use your visual spatial sketch pad, you'd probably walk through the inside of your house in your mind and count all of the windows. So that would be an example of how you would manipulate information in this inner eye or in this visuospatial sketch pad. You can visualize a physical space in your mind. Okay. 
So in this model, we're still on the working memory model. We also have what's called the central executive. And the central executive is what directs information between your working memory and these different other types of memory that we've named. So the central executive directs information back and forth between working memory and the phonological loop, the visuospatial sketchpad, and long-term memory, which we haven't covered yet. Guys. So long-term memory, you guys have probably heard that term. These are the memory systems used to store and recall information over extended periods of time. So not just a few seconds and not just while you're rehearsing the information. You're storing it over a long period of time and you might be recalling it much later. So long-term memory is used whenever you're cued to remember previously encoded information. So an example would be when I give you exam three, you're going to be cued by the multiple choice questions to remember previously encoded information that you learned in this class. Long term memory, interestingly enough, is believed to be nearly limitless in capacity. So there's no limit to how much you can remember. I think that's quite interesting. But of course, it can still be difficult to recall information. So even though it's limitless in capacity, that doesn't mean that we've properly um, stored everything we've ever learned. So it can still be difficult to then recall that information later. We have three different types of long-term memory. And those types are episodic, semantic, and procedural. So episodic, you can think of the word episode. These are memories that pertain to specific events episodes in your life. So I have an arrow pointing to a birthday cake. An example of an episodic memory would be remembering a specific birthday party that you had. That's something that you were really present for, you really experienced it. It's a specific event that happened in your own life. So episodic, an episode in your life. On the other hand, we have semantic memories. And these are memories that relate to specific facts and meaningful information but they're not based on personal experiences. So an example would be, what's the capital of France? That's a fact that you probably learned in school, um, but it doesn't have anything to do with a specific episode in your life. You weren't the one who um, named the capital of France. So semantic memories are facts that you've learned. They're not based on personal experiences. So most of the things that you learn in this class might be semantic memories. The three different memory types of long-term memory might be a semantic memory that you're working on learning right now. And then finally, we have procedural memories, and these memories pertain to some process. So if you think of learning to ride a bike and people say um, you don't forget how to ride a bike, that's because it's a procedural memory. Um, there's a process, there are physical steps, and these types of memories are actually more resistant to amnesia. So sometimes people with amnesia can't remember specific events in their life or things that they learned, but they can still remember how to do something like tie their shoes. Um, so procedural memories in this way are more resistant to some types of forgetting. Okay. So how do these memories get stored in long-term memory? We have something called elaborative rehearsal, and this is what you'll use when you study for an exam, for instance. So elaborative rehearsal is meaningfully relating new information, so new information that you're learning, to what you already know, what's already stored. So I have an example here of how I told you earlier we have a capacity of seven items in our working memory, seven plus or minus two. An example of elaborative rehearsal would be relating that new information that I just told you to what you already know. So saying, okay, I just learned that that capacity is seven plus or minus two, but I already knew that phone numbers have seven digits. So I'm relating this new information to something that's already stored. And this is going to help you better remember it and it's going to help you store it in your long-term memory. So elaborative rehearsal, you're elaborating on something, you're connecting it to what you already know, and this helps you remember things better. 
we also have different levels of processing. We have deep processing, and then we have shallow processing. Deep processing is better for remembering, and this involves encoding that new information by making meaningful connections to existing knowledge. So that example I just used of uh, remembering the seven plus or minus two by what you already know about phone numbers having seven digits, that would be deep processing. You're making meaningful connections. You're actually thinking about the meaning of the capacity of seven. Shallow processing is not as good for remembering, and this is just encoding information based on surface characteristics. And by surface characteristics, I mean things like maybe just what a word looks like or how it's spelled. So an example for deep versus shallow, if I told you to think about um, foxes. So deep processing might be thinking about the fact that, okay, a fox is an animal, it's a living thing, um, they're cute, whatever else you know about foxes. Shallow processing would just be literally looking at the word saying, okay, it has vowels, it's all lowercase, um, there's little attention paid to the actual meaning of what you're learning. So that's going to be shallow, and it's not going to be as helpful for long-term remembering. Okay. So all these different color slides that are this bluish color, these ones have the memory tips on them. So memory tip number two is elaborative rehearsal. And this is just connecting new information when you're studying to what you already know. So there's different types of elaboration, imagery, organization, distinctiveness, self-reference. So I'll talk about what each of these mean and what about, oh, sorry, that's the example I want to do. So an imagery is when you picture something in your head. So the more detailed you visualize something, the better you're going to be able to remember it. So if I have you visualize um, a chipmunk, the better you visualize that, the more easily you're going to be able to remember it. The more detailed your imagery is, the better it's remembered. Organization would be grouping things together based on some characteristic. Um, so if I gave you a big list of animals, um, maybe grouping them together by these are all birds, these are all mammals, these are all fish. So organizing it in some meaningful fashion. Distinctiveness is useful when you want to remember similar things. Um, and that might happen with some terms in this class where they're all very similar. Distinctiveness involves having a very overly specific idea of one term. And so if you're imagining a very specific instance of a word, it's going to help you distinguish it from other words. So I'm um, trying to think of an example. So if this were some sort of biology class and I was helping you learn about different types of birds and I wanted you to learn about a crow and um, distinctiveness might involve visualizing a very specific situation with a crow um, or imagining maybe even a made-up scene where you meet a crow, um, you're feeding it. The more distinctive and specific you make that, the more easily you're going to distinguish it from other similar black birds. And then finally, self-reference would be relating things back to your own life and making them meaningful to you in some way. So the more personal you make a memory, the easier it's going to be to recall it later. So um, this is the activity I wanted to do in person in class, but I have, what about learning this list of words? Horse, leaf, pumpkin. So these are just random words that I selected. Um, so if anyone has any ideas in the chat using some of these different types of elaboration, how could you creatively learn this list of words? How could you remember this group of words? So one easier one might be, what could you imagine? What could you visualize? Mm -hmm. So they're all found in nature. So organizing them in a group. Mm 
Yeah, so if you combine them into some sort of visualization, so a horse, maybe a horse is running and there's a leaf falling onto it or past it and it's running through a pumpkin patch, something like that where you're combining them all into one visualization. So these are all great examples of elaborative rehearsal. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving so that we can get through more of memory today. All right, so we're going to talk about each of these in more detail. Um, so I'm gonna go through this slide pretty quick, but some different encoding strategies for effective learning are to use spacing, which I'll talk about in a minute, using mnemonics, using techniques that fit with the function of our brains, so working with how we've actually adapted to remember things, and then retrieval practice, so practicing retrieving information. So I'm gonna talk about all of these um, in more detail. So the first one is spacing. And this is a useful strategy for studying and doing schoolwork. Massed practice, also known as cramming, is not effective for long-term remembering. So I think a lot of us have crammed for a test before. I know I have. Maybe you've stayed up all night, you pulled an all-nighter. You crammed that information, and maybe you were able to pull off a good grade on the test. However, for actual remembering, if you wanted to be able to recall that information in the long term, cramming is not effective. What is effective for long term remembering is using spacing. And the spacing effect is when you space out exposure to the information over a longer period of time. So this is helpful for episodic, semantic, and procedural memories. So you can see on the bottom right here, this chart of three different students and their studying technique. Leslie studied for a half hour on, how many is this, eight separate days. And she got an A. Lee Ann studied for in four hour chunks over the course of four days and got a B. And then Nora crammed for four hours the day before the test and got a C. So all of them are studying for four hours total, but spacing that information out is more effective for remembering. So that is why there's this discrepancy between grades in this example. Do you guys have any questions so far? And again, feel free to stop me if you do. So this is the tip that we just talked about. Memory tip number three is spaced practice. And an example would be using this when you're studying for your final exams. So studying for short periods over a longer stretch of time is going to be more effective than cramming the day before. So studying for 30 minutes every day for two weeks leading up to finals, it's going to be much more effective than tr trying to cram everything into seven hours the day before. Okay. The next strategy that I mentioned was mnemonics. And mnemonics are techniques used to improve memory that provide a framework for encoding and recall. So you guys might have used in this picture this mnemonic before. King Henry died unexpectedly drinking chocolate milk, or sometimes they say by drinking chocolate milk. And this is an example of a mnemonic. So we're using this framework to remember different things that fit in this sentence. So the different kilo, hecto, deca, I think the U is units that sometimes B for base, and then deci, centi, and milli, they all fit in this sentence, this acronym of K-H-D-U-D-C-M. So this would be an example of using mnemonics. And there's different types of mnemonics. Um, we have the PEG word technique, the method of Loki, and one of the videos I'm gonna post for you guys involves um, an instruction on how to do this memory palace, which is actually really cool. And then using acronyms. So these are all different types of mnemonics that you can use. The PEG word technique is just providing order and imagery to a list of things. So making a rhyme between words maybe. So if I wanted to remember bun, shoe, and tree, I might rhyme them. So one is bun, two is a shoe, three is tree. And that relies on you being able to remember the rhymes. The method of Loki, which is Latin for places, is using some actual physical place that you know really well. And you 
place things that you want to remember throughout that physical space in that um, visualized image. So the memory palace is just another term for method of Loki. It involves imagining that you're walking through some space you're very familiar with. So imagine walking through your house or maybe um, the route that you took walking to your class at school. And as you're walking through, you place those things you want to remember around the space. And then when you want to go back and remember, you walk through the space again, and then you remember those items as you pass them. So it's actually a really interesting tool. Um, and if you guys want to try the Memory Palace video, I actually find it works really well. And it's kind of neat. So I'll post that on D2L. And then again, you can use acronyms to remember. Now, so I have a video of an example from the office, um, but I won't play it now for you guys, but you can watch that if you're interested. Okay, so this is the video I was mentioning, Memory Palace. This just involves using that familiar layout of somewhere you're really familiar with, so like your dorm or your house, and placing the things you want to remember around it. So I also recommend that activity, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> Adaptive memory is a subfield of memory research focused on investigating how our brains have been evolved to learn and remember given things that are important to our survival. So things that are going to keep us alive are more easily recalled and living things are more memorable than non-living things. So a snake is potentially going to stick in your memory more easily because it could impact your survival. Um, something that is less important evolutionarily is not going to be as easily recalled. Hey Manny, we have a question on the chat. All right, thank you. Spacing. So repetition would actually be more like rehearsal. So rehearsal is when you repeat the information over and over. Spacing is when you space out the time that you're actually looking at the information or that you're actually taking in that information. So like if I studied for 10 minutes every day um, and I cut myself off at 10 minutes, I would be spacing out my learning throughout maybe a week. Whereas if I just studied all at once on the last day, um, I'm not going to remember as well as if I spaced it out. Yeah, does that answer your question? You can let me know if you're still confused. Okay, cool. Oops. Okay. So another encoding strategy is retrieval practice. And this is basically testing yourself. So retrieval practice is also called the testing effect. If some of you may have heard that term, I'm not sure. But the testing effect says that if you actually test yourself rather than just rereading something, you're going to be better at retrieving that information later. So repeated practice retrieving information is more helpful than repeated reading. And this can obviously be translated into studying for a test. So if you just reread your notes, that's not going to be as helpful as if you actually test yourself. So that's why it's called the testing effect. And you can see in this graph, um, studies have shown that if you look at memory um, retention of rereading versus reading and then testing, after five minutes, just rereading might be better for remembering. But then two days later, people that actually tested themselves did better. And after one week, they also did better. So actually testing yourself when you go to study and quizzing yourself is going to be better for remembering than just rereading your notes. So this is one reason why flashcards are so great and the Quizlet that Autumn makes are so great is because the testing effect says that actually practicing retrieving that information the same way you would on an actual test is going to be better for remembering. So memory tip number five, the testing effect. When studying, be sure you test yourself. Um, you can make practice quizzes, use flashcards, use those quizlets, have your friends quiz you, or practice teaching your friends from memory. So all these things that revolve, 
that involve actually retrieving information from memory, actually testing yourself, are going to be more effective in remembering. It's a lot better than just free reading your notes. So when we are going to retrieve things, we're using both what we have stored, so the information stored in our memory, and the cues that are available in the present moment in our current situation. So when we're recovering information for our long term from our long-term memory, excuse me, we're combining what we have stored in our memory with the current situation around us in the present. And we do this using cues. So cues are those pieces of information that help us remember events from the past. So if I um, have a multiple choice question on our exam, which I will, they'll all be multiple choice, um, the different answer choices, the four different options might be cues. So they're going to cue you into, okay, what was the answer to this? I remember hearing um, this word cues. That's going to cue you into, okay, this is the answer for that item. So cues are very important in remembering. An example might be if there's a specific smell that reminds you of your home. So that smell in this example would be the cue. It's helping you remember something. When we have free recall, that's remembering previously learned information without any other context to aid us. When we have cued recall, we actually have the aid of these clues or these cues. So that's providing context. So our multiple choice exam is gonna be cued recall. You're gonna have the cues of the actual answer choices. Free recall would be if you had to fill out like a short answer question. So Free recall, you have to come up with that yourself. Okay. I know I'm going through this kind of fast, so let me know if you guys have questions. Okay. Your book also talks about what's called the encoding specificity principle. And this says that cue, so that thing that's helping us remember, that retrieval cue is only useful as long as it matches how that information was originally encoded. So this is saying that the context matters when we're trying to retrieve information. So how we encoded something has a lot to do with how we are able to retrieve it. So your location when you're encoding information, the mood you were in when you encoded that information, and your mental state can all affect your ability to remember. So you're going to be better at remembering happy events when you're actually feeling happy. So sometimes when people are feeling depressed, they have a really hard time thinking about like anything good that's going on in their life. Um, that's because of this mental state and the context of feeling sad. It's going to make them better at remembering all the things that are going wrong in their life. And it's going to be harder to remember happy events. A similar, um, situation is remembering things you did while drunk when you're drunk again. So I'm sure this has not happened to any of you, but I put a picture of BTs here. So sometimes we have what's called state dependent memory and we remember things better when we're in the same state that we were in when that originally was encoded. So when someone gets drunk, they might the next day not remember what they did until they get drunk again, then that state dependent memory works better and they're able to remember those events. So the context is very important. Okay. So this translates into memory tip number six, which is transfer appropriate processing. And this just says, if you want to remember better, you should engage in similar processes both when you're encoding the information and when you're retrieving the information. So this enhances recall. So one example, and this obviously is not useful to you guys right now because you're taking online classes, but would be studying in our actual classroom. So if you encoded information in our actual classroom in Chubbs, then when you went to take the test, um, recalling that information in the same context in the same room is going to be enhanced. Another example might be, okay, how do we apply this to a multiple choice exam? 
using that same type of learning when you're actually studying. So when you're studying, try to discriminate correct answers from wrong answers, focusing on the differences between terms and quizzing yourself with multiple choice questions because you're actually going to be taking multiple choice, a multiple choice test. So making sure that the context, the scenery, um, the type of studying you do when you encode the information matches the context and everything that's going to be um, around you when you are recalling the information. Some studies have looked at whether chewing gum when you're learning helps you recall information on the test if you're chewing gum during the test. Um, that has pretty mixed results, so the jury is still out on that one. Some people believe vehemently that if they chew gum while they're studying, then they'll chew gum during the test and they'll be able to recall the things because um, of the context. However, there's mixed results, so you guys can try that if you want. I'm not sure if it'll be helpful. Okay. Also have explicit and implicit memory. Explicit memory is when you're intentionally trying to recall information. And implicit memory is remembering that occurs without realization or without intentionally trying. So an example would be, um, the example of explicit memory would be if you tried to, without looking right now, recall what the top row of letters on your keyboard are. So you might know the first few, but it might get pretty difficult without looking at it to remember what those letters are on the top row of your computer keyboard. However, I bet if you wanted to, you could write your full name out on your keyboard without even trying or looking. So that would be implicit memory. You're remembering how to do that without um, even trying, without intending to remember. You're just going about the procedure that you've learned. So that would be an example of implicit memory. Explicit is intentional, implicit Implicit occurs without intent. Okay. So I'm going to go through what I've heard called as these seven sins of memory. And these are just errors that can occur when trying to accurately re remember and recall information. So do we have a question? So there's two categories. First, we're going to go through errors of omission, and then we're going to go through errors of commission. So omission is when information is omitted. So information cannot be brought to mind. You can't remember it. So we'll talk about three types of those errors. Then we also have errors of commission. And this is where you're adding wrong information or unwanted information. So commission, wrong or unwanted information is brought to mind. We'll talk about four types of errors of commission. So errors of omission, something's being omitted. There's three different types of errors of omission. The first is transience. And this is just memory of some event degrading over time. You're forgetting that memory. So transience, an example might be, um, the first field trip you ever went on. So for some of you, maybe that's an important personal memory and there's a lot of emotion tied to it. So you might remember. I know for me personally, I cannot remember that. So that a memory has just degraded over time. It's been a long time. I've forgotten what that field trip was. So that would be an example of transience. Absent-mindedness is when the information wasn't encoded because you weren't paying attention or you failed to rehearse that information. An example would be losing your keys, leaving them somewhere in your house and you can't remember where you put them. So you didn't encode that information of where you put your keys down, you weren't paying attention, or you forgot to rehearse that information. And then the third error of omission is called blocking. And this is when there aren't enough cues available in the present moment to recover that memory. So this is that tip of the tongue feeling when you just can't quite remember something, there's not enough cues. So one example I like to think of is when you're watching a movie and you feel like you recognize an actor or an actress, but you just can't quite figure out who they are. Or sometimes when you're watching something animated 
you recognize their voice, but you can't quite put your finger on who that voice actor is. So that would be an example of blocking. It's kind of right on the tip of your tongue, but you can't remember it. There's just not quite enough cues. Okay. On the other hand, we have errors of commission. So this is where wrong or unwanted information is added. And we have four types of errors of commission. The first is misattribution. This is incorrect recall of the source of information. Um, so one example that I've had personally is thinking that I was alive to see Haley's Comet. So Haley's Comet last passed by the Earth before I was born in the 80s. And I miss remembered that for a long time. It turns out the comet I saw had a similar name, um, Hale Bop, if you guys have heard of that. Um, but I incorrectly recalled actually being there for an event that I wasn't there for. So that would be an example of misattribution. Um, so there's examples in flashbulb memories that are particularly susceptible. And flashbulb memories typically are something that are very, um, personal or traumatic or important in someone's life. And they can also often be emotionally charged. So an example of a flashbulb memory for a lot of people is 9-11 um, or the Challenger explosion. So these are flashbulb memories. Um, and a lot of people have misattributions about those events because they're so emotionally charged. So with 9-11, um, President Bush said that he saw or he remembered watching the first plane hit the first tower, um, but he said that before that footage was even released. So he had this false memory. He misattributed that memory of um, this very important event. So those are both examples of misattribution. We also have bias, and this is our memories changing as a result of our existing knowledge and beliefs. So bias in memories can become a big problem um, in eyewitness testimonies. So if someone is biased, they're looking at a lineup perhaps and trying to pick out a perpetrator, they might have biases about what the type of person would look like who would commit such a crime. Um, and these biases are going to lead them to misremember who they saw. So maybe they pick out this person number three, even though that person was not actually there. Um, or maybe that person was just an innocent bystander. This can happen due to our biases. We have persistence. This is memories being retrieved when they're not wanted. Um, and a lot of you might have experienced this in your lives when you're laying down to go to sleep and all of a sudden you're remembering um, your entire day or something bad that happened or something embarrassing that happened 15 years ago. So that would be an example of persistence. You're laying there, you're just trying to sleep, um, but memories are being retrieved when they're not wanted. Another example would be people with PTSD. They have these persistent memories that are popping up. They're not wanted memories. And then finally, suggestibility is when our memory is altered by outside suggestions. So I think we're going to save the Loftus study for next time, um, but this is a famous study in which people's memories were found to be easily altered by outside sources. Okay. So I know that was a lot of information, so I think we're gonna end there because we almost got through all of memory. Um, I don't want your guys, you guys to feel too overwhelmed. So let's stop it there, um, and we can pick back up and finish memory on Thursday. If you guys don't have any questions, you're free to log off. If you do have any questions, you can ask out loud or in the chat. So thank you. Is there a new homework? So chapter eight, which is the memory chapter, that homework is due Tuesday before class. So each homework in this unit is due on Tuesday. So one was due today, the next one is due next Tuesday, and then the third one is due the following Tuesday. Yeah, thank you. Let's stop recording.